This is Ashok Basava Patna in New York. And this is Alexander Repenning in Switzerland. And Hi, I'm Anna Labru, and this is our paper, Computing Effect Sizes of the Science First Then Didactics Computational Thinking Module for Pre-Service Elementary Teachers. The problem, or should I say the opportunity, is that in countries such as Switzerland, there are now national curricula in place forcing pre-service teachers studying at schools of education to learn how to teach computer science and computational thinking. This results in completely new audiences learning about computer science. Because of the new national curriculum, Switzerland crossed the gap between computer science education taking place only with early adopters and move on towards the majority of teachers. This is a systemic shift introducing computer science education to an entire country. Mandatory courses in computer science education are dealing with a completely new audience. This audience looks like this. Each year we are teaching 400 pre-service elementary school teachers. These teachers are essentially bachelor students at a school of education. So far we have been teaching over 2000 teachers. These teachers are 10 times less likely to be previously exposed to programming than the average Swiss citizen. So this is only 0.2% instead of 2.7%. So in other words, these teachers are not coming to a school of education because of computer science, but in spite of it. And finally, these are 75% women. Attitudes, for the most part, are positive, but there are some still common concerns about the perceived benefits of programming education or the use of computers by kids in general. Here are two quotes. If I'm being completely honest, I'm not that much interested in computer science. I find it problematic how many children these days just sit in front of the PC and play games or look at stupid stuff on the internet. I have the feeling that primary school is still the only place where you can keep the children away from electronic devices and the constant staring at screens. But now it's becoming more and more common in primary school. This is causing mixed feelings in me. Because of Corona, some ex are experiencing computers as more important than previously perceived. But then again, many hope that after Corona, the forced use of computers will fade as quickly as possible back to the level of computer use. The main approach of computer science education is based on the scalable game design strategy. Using game design as instrumental motivation for computer science education, including computational thinking. The module design dilemma is about taking an existing course design originally developed for self-selected, in-service teachers and to adopt that design to the constraints of schools of education, pre-service teachers through mandatory courses. These pre-service teachers may not be as eager to learn programming as the in-service teachers signing up to a one-week summer school. Additionally, the pre-service teachers are, uh, are sometimes somewhat anxious because, because they are forced to take and pass two 14-week courses to be allowed to become teachers. The design options were A, to have a science course followed by a didactics course, or B, to have two intertwined science and didactic courses, or to have C, a didactic course followed by a science course. Provided the pronounced lack of computer science knowledge, didactics first, in spite of its potentially motivating appeal, was not a compelling option. An intertwined design did not mesh well with existing school of education requirements. We decided to take the traditional path of science first, then didactics, but to design, evaluate and redesign these courses in a design-based research implementation, in other words, DBIR, fashion. The paper shares large data gathered over two years by 890 pre-service primary school teachers. This video focuses on explaining the course concept with the in-depth data representation left to the paper. The science course is a 14-week 
19 minute lecture each week plus homework course. The goals of the science course are to comprehend core ideas of computer science, to understand computational thinking as process based on higher level constructs, which we call computational thinking patterns, and the ability to create and debug 2D and 3D games and simulations. The course outline consists of 14 weeks to cover the seven big ideas from the AP computer science principles, creativity, abstraction, data, algorithms, programming, the internet, and global impact. Project-based activities are aligned with the big ideas. The teachers create a total of five games and simulations, including a final project. Agent Cubes is used as the 3D drag and drop computational thinking tool. Scalable Game Design teaches computational thinking through the design of games and simulations. A project first path, shown in blue, traverses the challenge versus skill space called the zones of proximal flow. This project first path focuses on challenges leading to skills, not the other way around. This way, learners are pushed from the zone of flow into the zone of proximal development. We found this to be the most effective to steer clear from boredom rather than first teaching principles which only later may be leading to exposure to interesting challenges. Teaching is grounded in learning computational thinking constructs called computational thinking patterns, describing typical interactions of objects in games and simulation settings. Gradually, learners are exposed to these patterns through more and more sophisticated games that they need to program such as Frogger and Pac-Man. Learners also start to build simulations such as ecosystems or they model the outbreak of a virus. Cubes enables a wide spectrum of projects including games and simulations that are 2D, 2.5D and 3D. In this example, a student built an ancient Egyptian world consisting of an elaborate set of interconnected worlds and puzzles. Solving the puzzles leads the player after collecting keys and facing dangerous guards and snakes, to the burial cham chamber where the final prize is located. In this 2D game, a teacher created four increasingly complex levels. In spite of their complexity, the majority of games can be captured with just nine computational thinking patterns, serving as reusable abstractions. In this game, she uses, for instance, the collision pattern describing frequent interactions of objects such as in this case, firebombs and the girl representing the player. And now we are switching to the didactics course. The didactics course is a 14 week, 19 minute lecture each week plus homework course. The didactics course has three main goals. Teachers learn to understand cognitive and affective aspects of learning designs in the challenges versus skills zone of proximal flow space. In that space, we distinguish four different states inspired by Csikszentmihalyi and Vygotsky, anxiety, zone of proximal development, flow, and boredom. Teachers acquire the ability to teach computational thinking through game design. And finally, teachers learn to evaluate themselves and others teaching. Over the course of 14 weeks, teachers acquire teaching skills by making project lets. A project-led is a small project serving as tutorial to teach computational thinking constructs. Teachers design and evaluate three gradually more sophisticated project-leds teaching computational thinking through making games and simulations. And teachers learn to design project-led so that they can provide different degrees of scaffolding. This is the slide used to present teachers a choice of three different STEM simulation topics. Build an hourglass, perfume bottle, or bacteria simulation. In teams of two, they had to figure out first how to program as well as to design the simulations themselves. This was a great test to see if they actually learned computational thinking and programming in the science course. Then they had to figure out how to teach making a simulation to their peers. In this process, they also had to learn how to make screencasts, including audio recordings. Because these videos are in German, 
I am showing you just a brief clip of a bacteria simulation tutorial. The video shows you the final steps showing the simulation running with the bacteria spreading exponentially. The project led number one process is based on three steps. The team of two teachers authors a YouTube video tutorial to make a simulation. Then the team observes two reviewing teams trying to build the simulation using the video tutorial. And finally, the team writes a reflection. Zones of proximal flow tutorials, or short CPF tutorials, are already much more sophisticated than linear video tutorials. CPF tutorials embody differentiated scaffolding. The green slides aimed at users in the flow zone of CPF represent the what slides introducing a challenge that, may, that many tutorial users would be expected to solve without further instructions. The orange slides aimed at users in the zone of proximal development of CPF represent the how to slides providing step by step instructions typically through videos to solve the challenge. Finally, the red slides aimed at users in a state of high anxiety or simply at users without the necessary time, provide a copy of a pre-baked project that users can inspect. Users can now clone this project to skip ahead and leave out uninteresting learning steps. We found that learning CPF tutorials was not only extremely effective to acquire pedagogical insights, but was also really appreciated as a concrete skill to communicate complex ideas to a diverse group of learners. The most challenging aspect of creating a well-working CPF tutorial is to understand the boundary conditions when to switch between the different degrees of scaffolding necessary. This one slide from a CPF tutorial created by a teacher is an example of a green what slide inviting users to create and program a maze. This slide provides minimalistic but sufficient scaffolding. Tutorial users can now use the green OK, the orange How and the red Show Me buttons to navigate through the challenges versus skills space, receiving different degrees of scaffolding. Good skills in designing CPF tutorials are indicators for good didactic understanding on how to teach what and when. The project-led process number two is almost identical to the process used for project-led number one. A team of two teachers authors a zone of proximal flow tutorial. The team observes two reviewing teams trying to build games or simulations using the tutorial. And finally, the authoring team pays close attention to the level of scaffolding invoked by the users. The ZPF puzzle tutorials used for the project lit number three are a variation of the project lit number two ZPF tutorials. ZPF puzzle tutorials are more open and much less prescriptive than the IKEA-like instruction to assemble a piece of furniture used in the video tutorials created in project lit number one. A CPF puzzle tutorial represents a sequence of puzzles. Each puzzle lays out a set of tools as well as objects and challenges the user to find solutions to puzzles using these materials. CPF puzzle tutorials allow students to design their own hour of code-like programming puzzles, including customized block palettes and video support materials. As before, teams get feedback from reviewing teams. This is an example what slide from a CPF puzzle tutorial created by a teacher. The puzzle is about the programming of a Sims-like world, including the character of a mother. The mother should be programmed so that she can walk on the floor in the house and on the grass outside the house. The mother should not be allowed to jump over walls or furniture or to step onto the cat. Zones of proximal flow puzzle tutorials are similar to many puzzles that you can find in places like the Hour of Code, where you have a selection of tools, <clears throat> in this case, a palette of conditions and a palette of actions that has been controlled by the puzzle designer. 
So in this particular case, we only see a very small number of conditions and a very small number of actions. My task is to make the mother, which is this person here, to be navigatable in, in the world that she can only walk on the floor in here and the grass. I could use individual conditions at the moment. She could be walking over everything, including the cat, including the wall. We don't want that. The, the task is to be able to only walk on the floor and grass. If I watch very closely here, I see that the floor actually has two different shapes. So instead of using an individual condition where I look only for a specific shapes, such as the floor, which would be true right now, I actually use the C A condition where I say, if I look to the right and I see a floor, then this would be true for both cases. So I'm going to add that to my rule to the right. So let's see, the, mo the mother can still keep walking on the floor, but can no longer walk uh, over the walls, but she can also walk on the grass. So I successfully solved the puzzle, at least for moving to the right. The assessment section of this presentation only focuses on two highlights determined from computing effect sizes. Based on a research instrument with 14 questions, comparing two years and using the same self-efficacy questionnaire 140 effect sizes were computed to assess the learning efficacy of the design. A self-efficacy questionnaire was used eight different times to compute effect sizes as Cohen's D. The questionnaire was used by 890 teachers before the science course and after the science course, before the didactics course and after the didactics course in 2018 and in 2019. The details are presented and covered in detail in the paper. A truly exciting aspect of using effect sizes is the existence of effect size benchmarks. These benchmarks allow us to compare learning gains with established and well-documented teaching practice in public schools. Hill reports 1.52, that is a very large effect size, as the average annual gain in effect size from US nationally normed reading tests. 1.52 is the effect size of reading improvements from kindergarten to grade one. Effect sizes tend to dramatically shrink over time. For instance, the annual gain in effect size for reading shrinks from this very large effect size of 1.52 between grade K and one to not even small effect size of 0.06 for grade 11 to 12. The table on the right hand side of this slide shows Cohen's D as effect sizes and different interpretation between 0.2 and larger than 2. These effect sizes would be small, medium, large, very large or even huge. We found a huge effect size of 2.18 for the self-assessment question regarding programming skills. This is the effect size computed from pre-science to post-didactics. This effect size is even larger than the 1.52 K to 1 reading improvement benchmarks effect size. Perhaps this was not entirely surprising, provided that initial exposure to programming for this audience was exceptionally small. While many questions only yielded small effects, or in some cases no effects, we were surprised to find relevant break effect sizes comparing the post signs to the pre didactics data. In that time, many teachers participated in school internships, which apparently sometimes positively and sometimes negatively changed their minds. In some cases, effect sizes of the break actually exceeded the effect sizes of the intervention. An example would be the question about whether or not they would like to learn programming. An exciting and detailed presentation and discussion of the data with 140 effect sizes can be found in the paper. I believe we have pretty compelling evidence that course designs, teaching computational thinking through game design, such as scaled game design, can be successfully migrated from self-selected in-service teacher development to mandatory 97% female pre-service teacher education. A science first, then didactics 
class module sequence prescribed by some schools of education may not be optimal, but is adequate when sufficient time is allocated. Now one can ask what the main conditions were to make this work. I believe the consistent use of meaningful computational thinking constructs was the key. We did not focus on just low-level programming skills such as programming sequences, loops and if statements. Instead, we focused on the scaffolding of computational thinking patterns. We used these constructs in the science course to teach the pre-service teachers to think computationally by building games and simulations. Then, in the didactics course, we use the same constructs again to teach teachers how to teach computational thinking to K-12 students using the zones of proximal flow tutorials. 